A number of years ago, my wife and I were in Australia, and uh, one of our uh, family members was actually graduating from a secular university in Australia, and we, oh, let me go back here. We, um, we went to the graduation ceremony, and the commencement speaker was a judge, and so they had all these graduates, there were hundreds and hundreds of them, they had all these graduates there, and the commencement speaker got up in front of them, and it was a very short address, but it went sort of like this. She got up in front and said, well, students, and, you know, the faculty were on stage with her. Well, students, here you are, and this is in front of, there were thousands of people there, it was a big university. Here you are, and you're graduating, and now you're asking yourself, I did all this study, I'm graduating, got my degree, I'm going to go out into the world. What am I going to do until I'm dead? I looked at my wife and said, wow, this is going to be an encouraging talk. <laughs> and she said, so I just wanted to share some things with you about my life because there are things you can interact with that can help you know what you should do until you're dead. She said, for instance, Three books particularly influenced my life. And I turned to my wife and said, I can't wait to hear about these. She said, the first one that had a great impact on me was The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> and where the computer is searching for the purpose and meaning of life, and it comes up with the answer, 42. I remember turning to Mally and saying, wow. 42. <laughs> I, I was contemplating that for a bit. 42. That's the purpose and meaning of life. I, I never would have thought of it. 42. And then I got back to listening to her and I realized I missed the second book. I can't believe <laughs> I said, I missed it. I got to get the first one though. And then she said, and the third book that influenced me you know, to this day, I still wonder what the second one was. <laughs> the third book that really had an impact on my life was Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. <laughs> I said to Mally, I have got to get that. <laughs> oh, by the way, I did. And I started to read it. The mythos over Logos argument states that our rationality is shaped by these legends and our knowledge today is in relation to these legends as a tree is in relation to the little shrub it once was and one can gain the great insights into the complex overall structure of the tree by studying. Anyway, it, that spoke to her. And then she looked at the student and she said, these books greatly influence me and my purpose and meaning of life and what I do. So you need to be a lookout on things that will impact you until you're dead. And I turned to my wife and I said, you know, if I was one of those students, I'd just go out there and jump off a cliff and get over and done with right now. <laughs> but you know what hit me? That is the predominant religion of our world. That is the religion of our public education system, by and large. It's the religion of our secular universities. It's the religion of most of our media. That is the religion that it pervades our culture. Generations of kids going to an education system, there's no God. You came about by natural processes. So in the end, just do what you can until you're dead. You know, the day after the ark opened, I took Bill Nye through for two hours. It was interesting. It turned into an informal debate. And we actually have it on DVD and it's on YouTube. And I asked him a lot of questions. And actually, it became a time to challenge someone who, for all intents and purposes, is an atheist. In your worldview, when you die, what happens to you? You're done. You're done. So why and if that turns out not to be true, yeah. that would be very exciting. OK, but if you say you're done, so you won't even know you're ever here. Apparently not. So then, why do you care what, what we're doing here? Why do you care about climate change? Why do, why do you ultimately, because ultimately when all these people die, they're done and nothing has any ultimate purpose. So why you does know, it matter? You know, why does it matter ultimately? So let's be clear. Okay. What we do 
is make more people. What yeah. organisms do is reproduce. But, but still, when they die, they're done. So why does it so matter? So my claim... Well, why does it matter ultimately? My claim is that not only your size and shape, number of fingers, eye color, and so on, uh -huh. is a result of the main idea in all of biology, uh -huh. evolution. Uh -huh. Not only is evolution the main idea in biology, but what you feel is also a result of evolution. But, but why does that matter if you're done when you die? I mean, why does, what? It, why does it all be matter? Everyone's done. They won't even know they're here. Why You're does asking this... fundamental existential questions. This is, yeah, this but, is but, great, but, Mr. Ham. But why? The idea is to pass your genes on to the future. To, but they, so they're going to they're gonna die and be done, too. So but why they'll does... become, so maybe they'll achieve great things that inspire us. But maybe they'll the... find out what happened before the Big Bang. What, what does it matter? Maybe they'll they... determine whether or not the core of... Anyway, the discussion continues to proceed. But think about the hopelessness of that situation, of that belief. When you die, you're done. Then what on earth is the purpose of anything they do? The American atheists had their convention this Easter, which is the reason we decided to do this convention here. But what hope are they offering to people? I asked Bill Nye another question. So let me ask a question. How do you determine what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad, on what basis? Like if these young people over here want to know what's right and what's wrong, how do you determine that? Two ways. Mm -hmm. First of all, based on what I feel mm -hmm. as a member of the human tribe. So feelings, so sub they're subjective. Absolutely. So your what feelings. We call subjective. Okay, but your we feelings. Call a result of uh, altruism. So your fi your feel. feelings could be different to somebody else's feelings. So the second thing. Is Correct. Your feelings could be different absolutely. to somebody else. The so somebody could have a different morality to you. Different morality. I'm open-minded, but a little skeptical. A different view of a specific event. Okay. So if somebody said to you, "I think types like you are dangerous. I want to get rid of you," would you say that's right or wrong? It depends. Okay. Okay, and here's right. the second thing. Mm -hmm. You remember I mentioned there were two things. Mm -hmm. The second thing is we establish laws. Like How do you decide right and wrong? Notice he said, it's all subjective. Then he said, absolutely. <laughs> because they can't be consistent. As an atheist, they can't be consistent. But for me and Bill Nye and this interaction, and for me, sitting there at that graduation ceremony, really they're examples of the religion of man and the battle between God's Word, that started in Genesis. In Genesis 2, obey my word, God said, and between man's word, when the devil came and said, did God really say you can be like God? And so this is really part two although it's a presentation that stands in itself, for what I did on Wednesday as the first keynote in talking about what's going on in our culture, what's been going on for 6,000 years is a battle between two religions and it started in the garden, a battle between God's word and man's word, a battle between a worldview built on the word of God and a worldview that comes out of man's word. And that's why for Bill Nye, when you die, you're done. I say, no, when you die, you're not done because our bodies die, but we're going to live forever. And we're going to live either with God or without God. And God provided a way for us as sinners to come back to be with him. Right or wrong? Well, consensus of the tribe. No, God is the creator. He owns us. He determines what is right and what is wrong. And it was very interesting as we walked through the ark then you see this battle between two religions again as a young girl came up to me and said she believed in God and hear what I said to her and hear what Bill Nye said. The non-supernatural cause. What's that? How did God create us? How did God create us? Well, you know what? As an infinite being, we don't know how he created. The Bible says he spoke and it happened. Because he So these are room power. for future exhibits here? Yes infinite power, infinite knowledge, infinite wisdom, and he's able to speak everything into existence. How did he, how did he raise Jesus from the dead? How did, how did Jesus raise Lazarus? Because he is all-powerful, because he's the infinite creator God. So, yeah, it's good to be here. So, young woman, I would say to you that there's a process 
that humans have developed over millennia by which we know nature. And we call that science. And I hope the big thing in science is questioning things. So are you, are you telling it's this, little, are you telling this little girl that she is just an animal? The word just, I disagree with. She's a wonderful, beautiful animal. I believe with cats. Say again? I believe with Mr. Hayes. Okay, so as you grow older, I encourage you to look at the world around you and make your own judgments. Yeah, but I, believe I may be wrong. You and know, you can decide you, for yourself. You know, the scripture says, from the mouth of babes and sucklings, she knows there's a God. You know too, Bill. Uh, so I disagree with you, Mr. Ham. So as you get older, just look at the world. I really encourage you to go to college. You know, if you heard what he said, little girl, you need to study science. And you also heard Bill Nye say, I may be wrong. So he doesn't know. He's not even sure what he believes. And he's not competent in what he believes. As Christians, we are competent in what we believe. And so it leads into this topic about science. Because what Bill Nye is saying and what he said at the debate in 2014 was when you're talking about creation in the Bible and you're talking about evolution, it's a battle between religion and science. But no, it's not. It's not a battle between religion and science. Which is why at the debate, I said we need to, first of all, when anyone uses the word science, we need to kind of challenge them and say, in fact, one of the things that I've, I've, I've encouraged people to do over the years is, is this. Look, when you're talking to people, they will use all sorts of words. You need to stop them and say, what do you mean by that word? So as soon as they mean, say science, I say, what do you mean by science? Evolution, what do you mean by that? Explain those terms to me. Because when you do that, most people just stop and they're not used to someone asking them what do you mean by those words. I find most people, most of these atheists actually that oppose us, just, they just regurgitate what they were told. They don't really know what they believe or why. See, if you look up the word science, comes from the classical Latin scientia, which means to know. And this is why I started the debate off this way, because I said, we've got to define our terms. If you look up the Merriam-Webster online dictionary, it says science means the state of knowing, knowledge. And one of the things that Bill Nye refuses to acknowledge, and you'll find the secularists refuse to acknowledge, and unfortunately, I'd say the majority of our Christian academics in our theological colleges, seminaries, and Bible colleges either don't understand, don't want to understand, or refuse to understand, is that there's a big difference between knowledge gained by experimentation using your five senses in the present that you can repeat that develops our technology and knowledge about the past when you weren't there. And so, using your five senses in the present to observe and repeat, we call that experimental observational science. But when you're talking about the past, when you weren't there, we weren't there to see God make Adam and Eve. We weren't there to see God make the land animals. Evolutionists weren't there to see life come out of the sea and evolve onto the land. We weren't there to see the Grand Canyon form. Evolutionists weren't there to see the Grand Canyon form. Let me illustrate this with a statement from Bill Nye. That you can show the earth is not flat. You can show the earth is not 10,000 years old. Now, Danny Faulkner just did a presentation on the earth is not flat. So Bill Nye said, you can show the earth is not flat. We would say that's true because, for instance, we know an, an astronaut someone who was a commander of the space shuttle, came and spoke to our staff, who showed us a video of being up in space and a video of the Earth spinning. You can show the Earth is not flat. But then he said, you can show the Earth is not 6,000 years old. No, you can't, because it doesn't have a label on it telling you how old it is. That's very different. The age of the Earth is different because you're talking about the past when you weren't there. Bill and I didn't see the Earth form. We didn't see the Earth form. I know someone who did, by the way. And he tells us that he formed it on the first day of creation. And you can add up the dates, and that's how you get the thousands of years, which I did in a little bit more detail on Wednesday. 
this illustrates a point a little further, because here's what I find. See, the way in which our, our children are indoctrinated, many of us have been indoctrinated, is that the secularists use the same word science for, say, the technology for a screen like this behind me, or a computer, or a jet airplane, and then they use the same word science when talking about origins. But that's different. Origins is different to developing technology. See, listen to Bill Nye here. Apparently, people with these deeply held religious beliefs, they embrace that whole uh, literal interpretation of the Bible as written in English uh, as a worldview. And at the same time, they accept uh, aspirin, antibiotic drugs, <laughs> airplanes, but they're able to hold these two worldviews. And this is a mystery. Wow, what a mystery. How can Christians believe the Bible with the account of creation about where we came from and believe in aspirin and antibiotics and jet airplanes? What a mystery. How can they do that? And one of the questions I asked Bill Nye at the debate, I've asked many times since, and I've just asked generally of secularists, give me one example, just one, only one, just one, where the belief in evolution by natural processes, molecules to man evolution, is absolutely necessary to build a piece of technology. There's no example, there's nothing to do with that. You don't believe the, use the belief in evolution to build an airplane? If you did, I wouldn't fly in it. <laughs> Talking about origins, I told you, how, how do they how do they make antibiotics? I mean, they're using their five senses in the present and testing the drug with, with bacteria and so on. The same with aspirin. and That's very different. But see, we have whole generations that have been brainwashed because the word science is used for origins and it's used for developing technology. Let me illustrate further, because Bill Nye actually at the debate used the example of forensic science. Well... He used the example of forensic science to say how we can use science to show what happened in, in the past, and he was talking about proof of evolution and so on, supposedly. Now, I'm not talking about the forensic science that you see on TV, NCIS and CSI, where they can solve the whole murder mystery in 45 minutes. But think about this for a moment. Because what Bill Nye was saying is you have to reject forensic science if you, if you say we, we, we can't prove what happened in the past. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You come into a room and there's been a murder. You've got the evidence right there. In fact, we have a forensic scientist on our staff and she actually uh, runs these educational programs over here. I encourage you to go and talk to her because we do these tremendous programs. She does forensic science programs uh, at our workshops at the museum for, for young people and adults too, sometimes too. So we come into a room and you've got all this evidence that's there in the present and you want to find out who done it, who carried this out. Now, there's an aspect of experimental or observational science in regard to forensic science. You can fingerprint people. You can, you can get the fingerprints that are there. You might find blood. You can sample the blood. You can, you can test uh, what type of blood it is, and then you can get somebody and say, oh, you've got the same type of blood. But, but even if they have the same type of blood, still doesn't mean that they committed the murder. Even if their fingerprints of this person alive were in that room, still doesn't mean they committed the murder. They might have visited the room the day before. You see, there's an aspect of historical science here, which is, well, who actually did it? How many times have people been convicted of a crime, and then years later, now they have more technology to be able to sequence DNA and so on, and they realize that person's innocent? Because even though the evidence seemed to point that way, they made the wrong interpretation of the past. One of my favorite detectives on TV is Poirot. Uh, and, and the reason I like Poirot is because you have this whole program, say it's an hour long, and you get to 55 minutes, and you're still, you're still sort of not sure who did it, and he gets everyone in a room, and all the characters are there, 
And then as he starts to bring forth the evidence and that you realize, aha, the butler did it. The butler's guilty. Then he goes on to the next person and then he brings up a bit of evidence that they never showed you through the whole movie. And it totally changes the conclusions. You go, it wasn't the butler. The maid did it. And then he goes on and, and, and then he brings up another piece of evidence you didn't have. And then he says, and so then we found this and that. And then you realize it was the cook that did it. And then you find out it's somebody else that did it and the movie ends and you realize what a waste of time watching that stupid thing. <laughs> you know what the problem is? To know for sure you need to have all evidence. Here's the problem. No matter how much you know, there's all an infinite amount more to know, which means no matter how much you know, you don't know how much more there is to know, which means no matter how much you know, you don't, ha don't know how much you do know or don't know in relation to whatever there is to know, whatever that is, which means you just don't know much at all. <laughs> Think about that. If you don't have all evidence, when it comes to interpreting the past in relation to what we see in the present, how can you be 100% sure you're coming to the right conclusion? Which is why Bill Nye said, I might be wrong. Because he recognizes, I believe, he doesn't have all evidence. When it comes to the topic of origins, how do we determine what happened in the past? You think about the account of the secularists. Big Bang, billions of years ago, somehow the earth formed as a hot mountain blob. You know, you had the stars, and then you have the sun, then you have the earth as a hot molten blob, and then the earth cools, and you get water, and life somehow forms by natural processes. Matter somehow generates a code and information system, and over millions of years, something jumps out of the ocean and gets onto the land. Sometime it goes back into the ocean as well, and, and you know, you get to your whales and so on, and then ape-like creatures turn into people. The Bible says God created the earth first covered with water. He says he did all this in six days. He created land animals after their own kind on day six. Day seven, he created the first two people, Adam and Eve, that Adam sinned. That's why there's now death in the world. That's why we die. There was a flood, a global flood at the time of Noah, 4,300 years ago. That's why we find fossils all over the earth. And then there was an event after that called the Tower of Babel, which formed different people groups, ethnic groups, cultural groups. They're totally different. Bill Nye and I represented those two views. How do we know which one's right? You would need all evidence or access to somebody who had all evidence. You know what? The Bible claims to be the word of one who knows everything, who's always been there, who doesn't tell a lie. In Christ, to hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge we read in Colossians. This, over 3,000 times, claims to be the Word of God who knows everything, who says, here's the information you need from history and geology, biology, astronomy, anthropology. Here's the history you need to have the right foundation, to have the right worldview to correctly understand the world. If you don't have that foundation, there is only one other, and it's somehow man determines truth. That represented me and Bill Nye. We had two different foundations. And I will say this, following on from what I did on Wednesday, those majority, unfortunately, of Christian leaders, academics, pastors, seminary professors, Bible college professors, certainly not all, but the majority who believe in evolution of millions of years and have reinterpreted Genesis in some way, as soon as you take man's fallible ideas and you add that to the infallible word and change it, your foundation is no longer God's word. Your foundation is man's word. You see, for those who adopt the secularist view, the naturalistic view, they believe that to understand the present, you take this belief of evolution, and that's the key to understanding the present. So for them, they believe ape-like creatures turn into people, so then when they 
look at fossils they find and they see these bones, you look at all the articles that appear every week, in fact, you'll, you'll see them trying to fit these bones somehow into evolution because they're taking their worldview and they're applying it to the evidence to interpret the past. So for them, man's story is the key to the past. And then knowing what supposedly happened in the past is their key to understanding the present. And so even just recently, there were these bones that were found in the Philippines and there was a paper out saying they believe there, there, there could be some relation to man in his evolutionary history and so on. And then you actually read the paper and there's just a few bones and the more you look at it, you realize the bones of apes. But because of the evolutionary belief, they're so deficit to trying to fit them into that. You see, they have a starting point. That's the point. It, you know, we're told that, oh, our kids are indoctrinated in public schools and universities. Scientists start from evidence. No, they don't. They have beliefs that determine how they look at evidence. Everyone has beliefs because they've been indoctrinated with this idea of neutrality when there's no such thing. They've been brainwashed with this idea that man is neutral, he doesn't have beliefs, we look at the evidence and the evidence speaks to us, no, 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 you have beliefs. Bill Nye, his belief is naturalism. He believes everything came about by natural processes. They say atheism's a non-belief. Atheism's a belief. A non-belief is a belief. They might have a non-belief in God, but they have a belief in naturalism. And so they're trying to explain all this by, by natural processes. They believe what the late Carl Sagan said, the cosmos is all it is or ever was or ever will be. There was a big bang billions of years ago. I mean, this is a belief held to all over the world by the majority of secular scientists and sadly, many of our Christian leaders, the majority have adopted this view. There was a big bang 13.8 billion years ago and the stars formed 13 billion years ago and the sun 4.6 billion years ago and molten earth 4.5 billion years ago and the first oceans 3.8 billion years ago. We know all that from digital photographs. <laughs> you know why you laugh? Because you know it's not true and you know nobody's seen that and you know it's their belief. They believe then somehow as the earth cooled, somehow life formed, a man called Darwin said, oh, look, we notice animals change. He was right about that. Animals do change. Dogs change. Did you know they change? Into dogs. <laughs> Cats change. Into? See, you caught on already and we've hardly even told you anything much. And over millions of years, one kind supposedly changed into another, ape-like creatures into people, and all this occurred when there's death over millions of years. You know, you know it always gets me... When you find the atheists, in fact, the local atheist group, they were so mocking the ark and they want to put up these billboards and so on to say, you know, God is a God of genocide and so on. And look, you know, these people that believe in the flood, but God wiped out all these people. God is responsible. You know, he kills all these people. Wait a minute. If you believe in naturalistic evolution, evolution kills everything. Think about that. But God is a righteous God and has the right to judge people because of sin. And then here the atheists are using a moral judgment against God. How can they do that? It's like an atheist once when I was answering a question. He said, you can't say that's, it. that's immoral. I said, you're an atheist. You can't accuse me of being immoral. They believe that over millions of years those layers were laid down with all the fossils. Much of the church has accepted their belief and added it to the Bible. But that's man's historical science. You don't see that. It's a belief applied to the evidence. But you might say, well, you don't see creation. You don't see Adam and Eve. You don't see the flood today. <laughs> if we did, I'd, I'd want to be on the ark. <laughs> you don't see the Tower of Babel. No, but... We have a book that claims to be a revelation from God who knows everything there is to know about everything. Who said, here's what did happen in the past. And if that's true, knowing what happened in the past is the key to the present. And you see, that's the difference. Because atheists will often say to us, but you, you start with a belief. Yeah, we do. But 
but you already start with, with the history and you've been told what it is. That's true. We have. And if it's true, it will make sense of the evidence and observational science should confirm it, which it does. And when you go to the Creation Museum, we walk you through that history that God has given us, a perfect creation, marred by sin, death as a consequence, the flood of Noah's day, the Tower of Babel. And we're getting people we, to do this. We want you to put on your biblical glasses. If this is the true history of the world that God, who knows everything, who's always been there, has revealed to us, then you put on your biblical glasses. Oh, that's why you find fossils all over the world. Oh, that's why there's death and suffering, because of our sin. Oh, it's a groaning world because of sin. Oh, that's why God stepped into history in the person of his son to save us, to offer us a free gift of salvation. Oh, that's why animals exist in groups or kinds. There's great genetic diversity, but they're after their kind, so separate kinds with barriers but you only needed two of each kind on the ark, seven pairs of some. Okay, it all makes sense. I get it. And then, of course, the most wonderful message of all, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I was so thrilled with that Fox News segment when they kept in where Bodie also presented the gospel and the door and the cross because that's what it's all about. That's why we built the Ark and the Creation Museum. We didn't build them just to have interesting arguments because we want people to understand this history in the Bible is true. The evolutionary history is not. And the history in the Bible is true. And so the message of salvation based in that history is true. But then there are people that say to us, but those two, those two accounts of the past, they're totally different. They are totally different. How could you have two different beliefs? They're so different. Bill Nye and you, so diametrically opposed, so opposite. That's what gets me when I hear these seminary professors saying, not all of them, of course, but many who say, oh, the order of events according to, to what they call science, evolution, is the same as the Bible. No, it's not. It's nothing like it. That's absurd. You see, creationists and evolutionists actually have all the same facts. You know Bill and I and I don't have any different facts? The facts are the same. An atheist here with me, we can talk about the same facts because they're all the same. The difference is not the facts. We have the same Grand Canyon layers. We can talk about the same fish fossils, the same dinosaur skeleton, the same animals, the same humans, the same DNA, the same radioactive decay, the same stars. You see, we have the same facts, but two totally different, two totally different explanations of those facts because we have two different starting points and thus have two different world views which we apply to those facts. You see, your starting point affects your whole world view. And that's why I've been emphasizing to us over and over and over again that we need to understand that as Christians, the Bible is not just a guidebook to life. The Bible is not just a book about spiritual things and moral things and relationships. This is a book of history that's foundational to our worldview. And the reason we have generations of kids tossed to and fro, baby, into doctrine, and what do they do with abortion and gender and creation and evolution and transgender and, and gay marriage, and how do you even understand these things? When you know where your thinking comes from, what its foundation is, and we did all that in the first session. When you know God created Adam and Eve, Adam from dust and woman from his side, and Jesus in the New Testament referred to that as the foundation for marriage, then you know marriage is a man and a woman because the history in Genesis is true as Jesus quoted in the New Testament. Then you know gender is male and female. We know that biologically, but even so, people can say, so what? We can change our gender. But God's Word says God made male and female. So biblically, it's male and female. 
And if you don't raise up generations who have that foundation to understand their worldview, they're not going to understand what to do with the evidence out there. And that's why even the issue of racism that permeates our media right now, it's only when you have the right foundation that you've got the answer because you can say, but we're all one race, we all go back to Adam and Eve. Different people groups because of the Tower of Babel. And so everyone is my family. And that's why I said when I spoke at the University of Central Oklahoma with the LGBT group sitting there, I don't hate you because I believe marriage is a man and a woman. That's not hate. I have a worldview because of my foundation. You have a different foundation. You've got a world, different worldview. We've got a clash of worldviews because we have different starting points. That doesn't mean I hate you. I want you to understand why I believe what I do. And you know what? Here's the point. When the Western world was permeated by more of what we call a Judeo-Christian ethic that came from the Bible, it was taught, even in our public schools, that marriage was a man and a woman. The gender's male and female. And so in a sense, you could say, well, that's intolerant of those who believe you can change your gender. Well, yeah, because, because this worldview comes from this foundation. Even if you're not a Christian, many people still had that respect for the Bible and had that worldview. But as that foundation changes and now you have generations of kids told it's man who determines truth and now my foundation is naturalism, there is no God, so marriage is whatever I want to make it to be, gender, I can do what I want with it, then you realize that worldview is going to be intolerant of the absolutes of Christianity. And that's the clash we're seeing. And as the coming generations, Generation X, Generation Y, Generation Z, as they come through and become the dominant people in our culture, and they are so secularized and have the foundation, it's man who determines truth, you'll find that those who are Christians and hold to a Christian worldview, that they will be discriminated against, and they'll be, they'll be called intolerant because... The worldview based on man's word is intolerant of the worldview based on God's word, which is intolerant, in a sense, of the worldview based on man's word. You see the clash? But what I find is this. Because those of us who are Christians and we understand our sin nature, we're not intolerant of those who disagree as people. We love them. And what we need to be showing them is where our thinking comes from and not trying to just impose our worldview on them because they won't understand that. That's what they see as intolerance. But we haven't raised up generations of kids like that. You see, when you start with God's word, we know there's only one race. Man's word, well, Darwin said there were different races and some were lower than others. God's word, marriage is a man and a woman. Man's word, well, you do whatever you want, whatever relationship you want. Why not? A consensus of the tribe. God's word, genders male and female, biblically, and we know that's true scientifically. But man's word, okay, so genetically you can see male and female, but you can change your gender, you can do whatever you want, because it's by a consensus of the tribe. Abortion, God's word, humans are made in the image of God, animals are not. At fertilization, you have all the information that builds a, a human being, and it's a unique combination. Abortion will be killing a human being. The Bible calls that murder. Man's word, get rid of spare cats, get rid of spare kids. We're all animals. What's the difference? And don't get me wrong. For instance, if you take the movie Unplanned, which we promoted in a big way. If you haven't seen it, I urge you to see it. Take your, whole, take your church, take your neighbors, take your friends. But the point I want to make is we can use movies like that to show people because we have a conscience. God gave us that conscience. We know. Ray Comfort was referring to that. We know there's a God. And we can show them abortion is killing a human being. But nonetheless, I want us to understand, ultimately, if we don't get them to the foundation that there's a God who owns them, who creates us, then ultimately it's still an opinion that you can't abort babies. In other words, yes, we use all sorts of arguments to show them 
And that's good, and that opens a door, and that's what, what Ray was talking about, using apologetics. But don't let it stop there. Because ultimately, the reason abortion is wrong is because God is the creator and his word is true. Ultimately, the reason transgender is wrong is because God is creator and his word is true. Ultimately, the reason racism is wrong is because God is creator and his word is true. So you see, when you're talking about origins, we're talking about historical science, but talking about origins, we also deal with observational science because we're also dealing with things in the present as well. Even with the abortion issue, your historical science determines how you view what's in a mother's womb, but observational science helps us understand what's in a mother's womb. You see what I'm saying? When it comes to the Grand Canyon, Bill Nye and I can agree on there's layers at the Grand Canyon. We can agree on the height of them. We can agree on the grain size. We can agree they're sedimentary rocks. That's observational science. But what we disagree on is the age of them, how it was deposited, because we weren't there to see it. That's historical science. And so the role of observational science is to look at our present world, the study of genetics, the study of geology, whatever it is, to see if what we see in the present and can experiment with confirms or denies our foundation for our worldview. And what we would say, and what we do at the Ark and the Creation Museum and in our resources, is the more you do that, the more you see it confirms the history God has revealed to us, because I'm telling you that is the right foundation. And that's why I know what I believe. I know why I believe what I do and why we can stand boldly on that. But you go to most of our Bible colleges, seminaries, and Christian colleges, and they don't stand firmly on that, and they don't teach that as the foundation, and they put that over here and say you can use man's word over here, and we wonder why we've got a mess, and a lot of these younger generations in our churches or that used to go to church are all over the place when it comes to moral issues. But what about those who come to you and say, don't give me that stuff about the Bible because I don't believe the Bible. And then, to go back to what I said on, on, on the first keynote, when someone says to you, I don't believe the Bible, many Christians have been told, well, don't use the Bible. Just use arguments with them, but don't use the Bible. But here's my point. Yes, you can use all sorts of arguments but if you give up the Bible as your foundation, there is only one other foundation left. And in an ultimate sense, you've lost the argument. And even though you might argue about some things and you could win some things here and there, if you've given up your foundation, ultimately you've said we can have a neutral argument. And I know Dr. Jason Lyle talks about this. You see, in Matthew 12, 30, it says, whoever's not with me is against me, whoever gathers scatters. Friendship with the world is enmity or at war with God, who by unrighteousness, the people who are against God, suppress the truth. It's not a neutral heart they have. They, it's suppression. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. The point I want to make to you is there's no neutral position. And if you give up your foundation of God's Word, then there is only one other foundation, and that's man's Word. And then ultimately, you can only argue on the basis of the same worldview as the others, which means they've won the argument. Or as Dr. Lyle has put it in the past, two knights fighting, and one says to you, before we begin, throw down your sword. That's a great idea. Let me throw my sword away. You say, that'd be stupid. I agree. But it's the same as... Christians and the secular world arguing and the secular says, put down your Bible, let's talk on neutral ground. You say, okay, I'll talk on neutral ground. Then really, in essence, they've won the argument. See, I want to give you an example. A number of years ago, and, and I'm not doing this to denigrate any person or be negative against that person. This person was a man of God in Australia. He became a parliamentarian, and this is a number of years ago, and he got on uh, what, what's probably one of the most watched television shows on public television in Australia. 
and he was with Richard Dawkins. And I want to show you what happens because here he is talking as a Christian with an atheist and he tries to be neutral. By the way, the studio audience realized how inconsistent that was. And not only that, I want you to watch what happens at the end where the host of the program says something like, well, where do you believe man came from and so on? And he puts his hand on Richard Dawkins um, and he said, you might want to ask this person, he's sure about his beliefs. In other words, we Christians aren't sure. He, watch what happened. Richard, you'd like to respond. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you believe the, the world is less than 10,000 years old? Look, uh, now, do you believe that? Look, I, I think that there are a lot of questions in this area, and I think people will come to their own conclusion. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to force people into one way or the other. You're not being asked and, to force. You're not being asked to force. You're a new earth creationist or an old earth creationist. Yes. So, which so is it, Steve? You're a, you're, a, you're a young earth creationist who believes the world is less than 10,000 years old. You're a... A parliamentarian in Australia who believes the world you live in is less than 10,000 years old. I, I, didn't, I didn't say that, by the way. You're saying that I said it was 10,000. OK. I didn't okay. say that. OK, no, you didn't, you didn't say that. Do so, you? So, do you well, believe well, it? No, so it is an open question, though. Um, Look, I, I is, think, is that what you actually believe? Look, I, I, think, I think that the, the science today will discover more and more, but I think that most Australians come to a view that either believe that it, we evolved or we, we, we came from creation. And I think that you know, people are, you can believe whatever they like on that issue. I'm not trying to force that issue onto anyone, Tony. So where did human beings come from? Well, you in may well ask this guy. He, he's, no, he's, he's, he's got firm views just, on it from that perspective in, in from there. View, ask Richard Dawkins. He's got firm views. I mean, we Christians don't have firm views. And if you notice, he was sort of mixing historical and observational science together. But here's what I would say to you. I'm not attacking him as a man of God. But unfortunately, that's where the majority of our people in our churches are at. He really reflects the state of the thinking in our churches, which is why I believe we lose so many of those battles, because we've got this idea of neutrality. And so many people aren't game to stand up for what they believe. Why aren't we? Why isn't the church leading the way in regard to the abortion issue, the gay marriage issue, the transgender issue, the racism issue? You know why? Because I don't believe we really believe the Word of God and know what to believe and have a foundation to know for sure what our worldview is. Because it hasn't been taught in most of our churches. And in fact, what's being taught is we don't know because we're not sure about Genesis and all different views and who cares anyway. Trust in Jesus. And so we don't have a worldview to deal with all these issues. 1 Corinthians 14, 8, if the bugle, if the trumpet, some translations say, give an indistinct sound, give an uncertain sound, who will get ready for the battle? Here's what I have seen. I've traveled all over the world, and I tell you what, you only got to watch television, read newspapers, books, and so on. In this era... I would say that the secular world are unified around the globe. They have differences, but they're unified in this sense. If you go to a university or a school or you're going to any, any culture around the world and you say, what do you believe? The secularists will say there was a Big Bang billions of years ago. Uh, everything came about by natural processes. Life evolved. It started in the oceans and evolved onto the land. Ape-like creatures into people. I mean, there are differences here and there and all the rest of it, but they give the same sound around the world. They give a certain sound. But then if you go to churches and Bible colleges and seminaries, Christian leaders, Christian academics all around the world, and you say, what do you believe? Well, I'm not really sure. Well, you know, I think there could have been a global flood. Well, I'm not sure. I think it was a local flood. Well, I think God used evolution. Well, I don't know. I believe in the Big Bang. I think God used the Big Bang. Well, I don't believe in the Big Bang. I think there's a gap between Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2. Well, no, I don't believe that. I think the days are long periods of time. Well, no, I'm not really sure. I think God used evolution. Well, I don't know. Maybe he evolved the animals and then maybe he created Adam and Eve. Well, I'm not sure. Maybe Adam and Eve were just metaphors. Uh, may, may, who, who knows? But anyway, trust in Jesus. And you know what we're seeing? The church is giving an uncertain sound. The secular world is unified, 
And I would say the majority of people in our churches are unified in this sense. They're unified in saying we can accept what the secular world is saying about millions of years and we add that into the Bible somehow. But they're not unified on the Word of God. But the secular world's unified on the Word of man. What a sad situation. And so people come to me and they say, well, how do you think we should deal with things? Well, like I said on, on, at the first keynote, when somebody comes to me and says, don't give me the Bible, I don't believe the Bible, first thing I say is, you don't believe the Bible? No. Well, guess what? I do. If you don't believe the Bible, come on, make my day. <laughs> I want you to ask me questions. I want you to tell me why you don't believe the Bible. I want you to tell me why, why what I'm saying is wrong. Do you know why many Christians, I believe, won't do that? Because we know if we do that, they're going to ask questions, and most Christians don't know how to answer them because we haven't been taught apologetics. And we haven't studied it. And another reason they won't is because many Christians think, well, I don't need the Bible, I can be neutral. Because they don't understand that. And you see, the problem is the non-Christian, by and large, doesn't understand they have a foundation. Because they've been indoctrinated to believe, just like everybody else, basically, that they start from evidence. And they don't understand they have a worldview. They don't understand the difference between historical and observational science. And to give you a practical example, an atheist came to my office when we were opening the Creation Museum and was interviewing me for the BBC in London. Her name was Eugenie Scott. And she was the head of an anti-creationist group in California that monitored what happens in schools and so on. It's called the NCSE, National Center for Science Education. But they're all about evolution, which means historical science, not observational science. So even that in itself is a brainwashing. So here's this person who was a vowed atheist, said on their website, they're an atheist, sitting in my office, and she says to me, but you agree you start from the Bible, don't you? I said, yes. She said, see, that's religion. She said, I'm a scientist, and real science, scientists start with evidence and develop our theories, and we change when new evidence comes along. She said, your views are set by the Bible. You won't change. I said, now, let's clarify. Won't change what's in the Bible. That doesn't mean we don't change our models, but won't change what's in the Bible. She said, but that's religion. Your views are set. She said, we're prepared to change our views when new evidence comes along. I said, Dr. Scott, yes. You're an atheist. Yes. You don't believe in God? No. You don't believe the Bible is God's word? No. You're not even prepared to look at the possibility Genesis could be the true account of creation? Well, no. I said, are you prepared to change that? And just for a fraction of a second, I believe I saw a little tweak of her lips. Because I think for a fraction of a second, she realized what I did. When I was saying to her, your views are set. Yes, I start with the Bible, but you have set views. She was trying to make out they didn't, but I did. And the other thing I was doing was pointing out to her the difference between historical science and observational science. So then we come to the question, the ultimate question. If this is true and we've got two foundations that are totally different, two different worldviews, and this clash up here is because of this down here that started in the garden 6,000 years ago, how can we get someone to change their foundation? Here's my answer. We can't. It's only God who can. You see, the Bible says we're dead in trespasses and sin. Uh, trespasses and sins. Lazarus was dead. Lazarus could not raise himself from the dead. My late brother, Robert, who was a great Bible teacher, went to be with the Lord about 17 years ago. And he would say... When I talk to a non-Christian, I remind myself I'm talking to a dead person and only God can raise the dead. 
and I realized I was talking to a dead person in my office. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that does good, not even one. It says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, the Word of Christ. It's the Word of God that's living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's God's Word that goes out from His mouth and shall not return to me empty. Not man's Word, it's God's Word. And by grace, you've been saved through faith. It is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. But at the same time, the Bible says, it is not God's will that any should perish. And he says to us, how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without someone preaching? And how shall they preach unless they are sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news? And it says, always be ready to give a defense, to give an answer for what you believe. And, and, you, and you look at that, and on the one side, we're dead in trespasses and sin. By grace you are saved through faith. It's, it's God's word that will not return unto him void. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. On the other side, but it's, but it's God's will that none should perish. And you get out there and preach, and you teach, and you give answers. How do we bring that together? You see, we're finite beings. And you know, we get into discussions, and I don't want anyone coming up afterwards and saying, so are you a Calvinist or an Arminian? I'm both. Because I don't believe you can define things in human terms like that. Because we are dead in trespasses and sin. It is only God who raises the dead, but God calls us to preach and teach and give a defense of the faith and give answers. And so my analogy as to how I believe we as Christians should be doing things, which is really what we do at the ark. You start to think about it in these terms, what we do at the Creation Museum. Jesus came to the tomb of Lazarus. Lazarus was dead. And he said to people, you take away the stone, you move the stone. Jesus could have moved the stone with one thought. He could have said, stone, go. But you can move the stone, so you move the stone. You do what you can do. I've called you to do that. And so they moved the stone. And then Jesus did what those people couldn't do. Lazarus, come forth. And the, and the one who is the resurrection and the life, raised the dead. I look all the way through Scripture, I see man's responsibility, God's sovereignty. Man's responsibility, God's sovereignty. Man's responsibility, God's sovereignty. You know, someone earlier asked me a, a question about, you know, security, and you know we have security at the Ark and the Creation Museum. And the reason is we, we believe in the sovereignty of God to look after us, but we believe in man's responsibility to do what we can. It's the same for our fundraising. For our fundraising, what we do is we share with people. Many of you in this room are our supporters. We share with you our needs, our vision, what we're doing. But we can't tell you to give. That's not our job. But then we pray and ask the sovereign God to burden those whom he would burden to respond to give, which is why we have this building. It's why we have the ark and the creation you see. You see, it's God's, respond, it's God's sovereignty, man's responsibility. And so, our responsibility, teach, preach, give answers. We're moving the stone. We're doing what we can, give, answering those stumbling blocks. We do it in many ways, through books, through movies, through, I mentioned the unplanned movie before. It's all part of moving the stone. That's what that all is. Our books out there, our DVDs, it, it, our teaching, it's part of moving the stone. But you'll notice something about Answers in Genesis. You'll notice something about the Ark and the Creation Museum. We always point people to the Word of God and the gospel, because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It's God's word that will not return unto him void. And that's what it's all about.
It's one of the reasons why we have such an emphasis on, on resources. I've always had that emphasis because we're moving the stone, doing what we can, move the stone, but point to the Word of God. Our Answers in Genesis website, thousands of articles, they give all sorts of answers, moving the stone, but point them to the Word of God. I wanted to mention, because this is our final teaching session in that sense, not that tomorrow morning is not a teaching session, and not that tonight's not a teaching session, we're going to learn how to eat banana splits <laughs> and to watch that movie. We have Ben Price, he's incredible, Australia's foremost impersonator. <laughs> but we, we do all we can to get the information out there, and I appreciate our relationship with PureFlix. I encourage all of you to be a part of what they're doing, even to support them in helping to provide faith family, friendly family, streaming in a culture that is so turning against God. And you get all of our videos, and that's another way for us, a platform for us to get all of our material out there. It's incredible. And if I need to go and put more books in your box, I'll consider doing that. For those that have been at the conference, you know that uh, you've been putting books in your boxes, and when you're ready to check out, do so, by the way. Uh, and uh, I, I always encourage people to get resources, as we will tomorrow morning, too. And we have those special ways in which you can get resources at discounted prices. And again, just to remind you of the basic core message of our ministry, my book, The Lie, that is the basic core message, other than the Bible, of course, which is the textbook of our ministry. This is the message of Answers in Genesis, our book on evangelism, to understand the change in the culture, because there's been a change in foundation in the coming generations from predominantly God's Word to man's Word. And we need to approach them differently in the way we present the gospel. And those answer books, five answer books that have 160 of the most asked questions answered. All this is part of moving the stone. Even my book, The Lie, is to deal with re removing the stone in, in regard to our Christians, people in the church, and Gospel Reset, understanding the stone that's in the way that we need to get, to get moving so that people will hear the message of God's Word in the Gospel. And then the Answers books, the most asked questions answered. They're our core ministry books. I encourage you to get. We have many other individual books. People have told you about those all week. Uh, for those visiting today, there's lots of books out there for kids as well, uh, like One Blood for Kids. Again, the answer to racism, teach your kids. Teach them about skin color. We're all the same color. We're all one race. Teach them about dinosaurs from a biblical perspective. Give them those answers. We have answers books for kids, middle school and younger. The same problems, the same stones that we need to remove for children. Teach them the gospel without the door of the ark to go through. Connect the Bible to the real world in all sorts of areas. Teach them a Christian worldview, starting as young kids. Learn how to defend the Christian faith. And volume three of World Religions and Cults, learn how to speak to atheists, to agnostics. And, uh, you know, the debates I did with Bill Nye really practically apply all that, because when you look at that debate and then look at the second debate, what I was doing was moving the stone and you notice something in the debate with Bill Nye that many people were sort of surprised at and many said they were so thrilled at was that I didn't just move the stone, I pointed people to the Word of God and the Gospel. And who knows how that's working on Bill Nye's heart. I did my best to move the stone. I pray God will soften Bill Nye's heart. And then six of my major programs done up as 12, 30-minute programs.